Well, welcome to this talk on Huntington's disease, which is a progressive neurodegenerative genetic condition. And we know a bit about the genetics of this condition. We know it's an autosomal dominant mode of transmission. Now, an autosome is one of the 44 ordinary chromosomes, as opposed to one of the sex chromosomes or gametosomes. So the sex chromosomes are the gametosomes, and they are the X and the Y chromosome. The other 44 chromosomes are autosomes. So Huntington's disease is actually transmitted by the fourth of the autosomes, chromosome number four. So it's an autosomal condition, and it's dominant. Now, a dominant condition is one, or a dominant gene, is one which will be expressed if it's present. So if a dominant gene is present, it will be expressed, as opposed to a recessive gene, which will only be expressed in the absence of a dominant gene. And what this means in practice with an autosomal dominant condition is that if any parent has the condition, there is a 50% chance that any children will be affected. A 50% chance. And because it's dominant, it also means that there will not be a carrier state. So with recessive disorders, a parent can carry the gene onto the next generation without necessarily suffering from the condition themselves. But with autosomal dominant conditions, that is not the case. If the gene is present, it will be expressed. And in the case of the Huntington's gene, the person will suffer from Huntington's disease. So there is no carrier state. And we now know that Huntington's disease actually is what's called a triplet repeat disorder. Now, this is a bit complicated, but in the DNA molecule, there are nucleotide bases. And three, of, three nucleotide bases in a particular order code for one of the 20 amino acids. It's called the triplet code or one codon. So three base pairs forms one triplet code or one codon. And that is the amount of genetic material required for one amino acid. So in the normal situation, three base pair nucleotides code for one amino acid forming one codon, one unit of genetic instruction. But with Huntington's disease, these codons, and each codon, remember, is made of three nucleotides, are repeated several or many times. And because the disordered codon in Huntington's disease codes for an amino acid called glutamine, that means that you get glutamine repeats in the proteins that are formed. So to put it simply, in Huntington's disease, there are proteins formed with too many glutamate amino acids in the protein. These are the abnormal proteins of Huntington's disease. If you like, these are Huntington's proteins. They are abnormal. Now, Huntington's disease occurs all over the world. Thankfully, it's not that common. About five in a hundred thousand people might suffer from Huntington's disease. So let's think about what goes wrong. What's the pathology here? Well, abnormal Huntington protein accumulates in neurons. So this abnormal protein with too much glutamine in it accumulates in neurons, in nerve cells, and that abnormal protein will kill the cells. So there will be neuronal cell death. And there's a strange phenomena going on here as well called anticipation phenomena. And what this means is that if a parent gives the disease to their children, then the children will suffer from the disease at a younger age than the parents started to suffer from it. So with every generation that the disease is passed down, the next generation will develop clinical features at a younger age than their parents did. And this is because of progressive expansion of the repeat sequence. So in every generation, there's more and more of this abnormal glutamine in the Huntington protein. 
and there is some cerebral atrophy. But what's obvious when you look at scans is there's loss of small neurons in the chordate and the putamen. Now, these are parts of the basal ganglia. So really, there's loss of neurons in the basal ganglia. And we considered these basal ganglia when we talked about Parkinson's disease, because they're actually part of the extrapyramidal system. So imaging shows atrophy of these basal ganglia, the chordate nucleus and the putamen. They actually get physically smaller because the cells in them die, because the cells are accru um, accumulating this abnormal Huntington protein. And this Huntington's protein has got too much glutamine in it because of the genetic disorder. So it does all kind of make sense, really. Now, we know that the basal ganglia are part of the extrapyramidal system. Therefore, you would expect some sort of movement abnormality as these basal ganglia deteriorate. And in fact, that's exactly what we see in the clinical features. Now, typically features of the disease present in midlife. So typically someone will present in their late 20s, early 30s. That kind of age is typical of onset of the clinical features. And there is progressive career. In fact, when I was a student, we used to call Huntington's disease Huntington's career. And what career describes is jerky, sort of all of a sudden an arm will move up or something will jerk up. And they're quasi purposeful movements. So the kind of the patient likes to think they've got a purpose, but in actual fact, very often they're just jerks. And uh, the patients can be a bit fidgety as well. They have difficulty sitting still sometimes. So there's these abnormal career type movements, which, of course, affect all of the activities of daily living. The patients can't control their arms properly because they become jerky and the legs become jerky. So they have these jerky career type movements and also these patients develop psychiatric symptoms no question about that and they can develop all sorts of strange psychiatric behaviors as a result of the progressing Huntington's disease but eventually the psychiatric symptoms will progress on to frank dementia the patients become obviously demented so this is a cause of dementia and later on in the condition, there can be seizures. The patient can start to fit. Now, you can get this sort of tonic-clonic fitting, what used to be called grand mal fitting, any time there's an anatomical abnormality in the brain. Because the abnormal structure in the brain, the anatomical pathology in the brain, can give rise to abnormal electrical activity. And that's what triggers a fit. It's abnormal electrical activity that triggers fitting. So this starts off with career, jerky movements, all sorts of problematic psychiatric symptoms, and then dementia, and then fitting would be a typical evolution of the condition. And death normally occurs 10 to 20 years after the diagnosis. So again, as with many neurological diseases, these patients are a very significant nursing challenge because you can have 10 to 20 years of morbidity to cope with. And also because the disease presents in midlife, very often patients with Huntington's career have already had children, they've already reproduced. So you've got the issue of have the children inherited the Huntington's disease genes or not and in fact I have talked to some people who say that in the early stages of Huntington's career there's increased level of sexual interest so it may be that there's more sexual activity while someone's in the very early stages of Huntington's disease or about to develop Huntington's disease which of course can make the transmission of the abnormal Huntington chromosome even more probable well, if you know the genetics of the particular family, the diagnosis is usually fairly obvious from the genetic history, but it can be made on clinical grounds as well. The career, the psychiatric symptoms, the developing dementia. But also on CT or MRI, you can see the reduced size of the basal ganglia. And that's usually quite an obvious uh, radiographic diagnosis. 
And then genetic testing is also available. And in fact, this is true for quite a few genetic conditions these days. Tissues or blood tests can be sent to genetics laboratories and they can actually identify the presence of the abnormal gene. So if someone's got Huntington's disease and blood is sent to the genetics lab, they can actually tell you whether someone's got the disease or not from their genetic analysis. And that's got further implications because that means if someone with Huntington's disease has got children, those children can be genetically tested to determine whether they've got the Huntington's gene or not. Now, if they've got the Huntington's gene, it's a dominant gene, so it's guaranteed that they will go on to develop Huntington's disease. And that's an awful thing for a child to have to live with. All through our adolescence and early adult life, that individual would know that for a certainty they were going to develop Huntington's disease. But conversely, if genetic testing was done and the gene was absent, then it would be possible to guarantee that that person would not develop Huntington's disease. So sometimes quite a difficult decision knowing whether to get genetic testing or not. And uh, patients have the right to choose for that genetic test or to have the right not to know. Patients have the right not to know as well. Well, what do we do about treating this condition? Well, basically it's symptomatic. We try and treat the symptoms as they present, but it's very difficult. There are some drugs that can slightly reduce the degree of chorea as a symptomatic management. Depression is reasonably common in patients with Huntington's disease, and depression does respond to the usual treatments, such as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And of course, these patients are going to need genetic counselling, and their families are going to need genetic counselling because we're dealing with an autosomal dominant genetic condition. Genetic condition.